welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and Crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Patrick Gunnels, Benter, Will Brax, Melby Styles, Troy Shuka, Bosnail, Joseph Pizarro, Sampson, Maris, Mobile Mac 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Dal West Watson, Mike, Dick Earth Skeptic, NA Literalist, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, TheFlatEarthChannel.com, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, Kirsten Smith, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I'll hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. I'm coming down. I took my wife to the doctor on the way back. I wanted to stop at a diner, so I made a left instead of a right. So I make the left, and then I bang the Yui right away back to the light. And I'm looking in my rearview mirror, I see this like um, SUV doing the same thing. And I'm like, oh, is this a freaking cop? So the light turns green, I go through it. Sure enough, the lights go on, he pulls me over. So he comes over, he says, you know why I'm pulling you over? I said, yeah, I pulled the Yui over there. I was supposed to make a right, but I made a left. He says, no, you on your cell phone. I was like, what? So he goes, I don't mind the U-turns, just... Next time, do it a little down further. I give him my license, so I figured a lot of times I like to check to make sure they got no warrants, no outstanding tickets, and they usually come back and they give you a license. This guy comes back with a freaking ticket for me for being on a cell phone when I wasn't on a cell phone. First of all, I got a hands-free device. So I'm like, I was not on the cell phone. So we start getting back and forth into it. So now I'm pissed. My balls are twisted. I'm respectful to the point when you give me a ticket, then I got no use for you. Now it's just give me my ticket and let me go. Well, I have to tell you all of this. You don't got to tell me nothing. Just give me my ticket, give me my license, and let me get the frick out of here. So he goes, you know what? Now I'm going to write you some more tickets. I said, go ahead, write them. And he did. He wrote me like freaking two more tickets. So now I got to go to court. Right. But I'm gonna beat them all because I'm taking them all the trial. I'm not here. I'm not copping out to nothing. Not parking on pavement. Nothing. How much? Trial. That's it. Yeah, yeah. How much? Don't know. You don't know until you go there and you negotiate. These small towns, this is how they make their living. He was there for one reason and one reason only to spot people on their cell phone. No, I don't know if at that time I was moving it from but I don't think so because it's right on, you know, right on uh, the um, the air conditioner thing, the vent. I got a hook on it's on that. And your show is on. So when I want to talk, I just reach and I hit the button. It's never in my hand. You know? So, like, I'm going to take them all the trial. I'm going to beat them. Okay. Good for you. Very good. I hope. But I should have just shut up. Yeah, you should have done. I can't one because they, they're trying to hurt me financially. Most of the time you go to court, they're gonna win. I've beaten a few of them. But um you stand, you take you you, you swear to tell the truth, but they're gonna believe him over me. I'm hoping that by the fact that my my car is a total hands free device, cell phone's been out for how long? How many tickets have I got with a cell phone? Oh none. You know why? Because I'm never on it. So we'll see how I can argue with that. Anyway, as the world spins. It doesn't spin. Oh, no, no, no. Contract, contract. I heard it spins. 
I heard it spins too. It doesn't though. That's it only spun because you made a U turn in the roundabout. <laughs> right, let's sort you as we've got a, a fairly clear panel tenth. What are you on your Yeti? <laughs> What's going on? That wow. wasn't me. That wasn't me. Ah, no no need. Don't blow your nose. <laughs> oh go uh, on, you anyway, tenth. He was up. It's it's not interrupted something like important in discussion. We're just going to talk technical. <laughs> so Yeti, I don't know if I made this clear yesterday. You're going to talk to the the red light. Do you understand yeah. what I mean by that? It's yeah, it's in front of me. It's just further back. Let me. It, it's pointing up, like you said. So let me bring it just where I had it before. How's Imagine, it now? Yeah, you need to be about a foot or less from. Okay, it. that was it then. That's better. And then how on the back of it, if you can look on the back of it, there's four yeah. different modes. Yeah. And you want the one that looks a bit like a heart or a bum. Fanny. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one uh, at the far right. No, it's not the far right. Second from far right. I think it is the second. I can't be bothered to stand up and look at the Okay, back I just switched it there. Okay. It Check looks, like a, looks like a heart slash... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it now. Okay, what what number gain are you at? Just say check one two one two. Check one two one two. How okay, far away? I just turned it all the way down. It was up maybe a little bit. Yeah, turn it up a bit. Check one two. 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 Check Louder. one two. You need, you need more gain, or you need to get closer, one or the other. How how many inches are you away? Check one two. Check one two. How many inches away are you? Hello, oh, um, twelve inches. Can you get? Can you get any closer? Yeah, I can get closer. It's just a, my back's going to be in a leaning position to the oh, desk. No, no, now. not if it's not if it's uncomfortable. You can't bring it closer to you, closer to the edge of the desk. Um, let me see. Yeah, how about now? Is this better? That's much better. And then what? What? Where's your gain setting? It needs to go up just a smidge on the back. The gain. All right. Hold on. Okay, this is at the middle point. Gain set the middle point of the dial. Twelve o'clock. Yeah. Set it to twelve thirty or one o'clock. Check one two. Check one two. Good enough. Okay. Just but get yeah. closer as best. As long as you're talking into the front of it, talk to the word blue. Gotcha. Yeah, it was pushed back. I forgot to. It was good the other day, though, right? Uh, yeah, it was okay. It does sound different, though, if I got to say. Just now you were sounding really clear and good. Other times it sounds like you're like in a, a room. I'm in the room. <laughs> in like the empty room, like when I'm working and there's echoing. Yeah, that's any room. It's just a, it's a, 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 what we can hear is you rustling the desk or anything. Well, I'm, I'm moving it closer so oh. I don't have to touch it when the show's on. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Simple. How about now? It's right in front of me. That's perfect. You sound crystal clear. Got it. All right. And it's Again, cut everything's good, right? Yeah. Well, there's the old tent. Cut out a lot of the room noise just by having it closer. So it's a condenser mic, so it's going to adjust itself to you. And then because you're closer, it's going to have less ambient noise. Anyway, um, I watched a review recently where they were reviewing all sorts of different mics that are good for a podcaster. And mm -hmm. the Blue Yeti was on there as is one of the guy's least favorite in that price range. And the reason was because it's so easy to get it wrong. It's got four different polar patterns. You were on the wrong polar pattern. Initially, you were talking into the wrong part of it on the wrong polar pattern. So it sounded awful. No, no offense. You just don't, you don't know what you don't know. I didn't either. When I first got mine, I was talking in the top of it. And Anthony was like, it's front address mic. And I was like, get lost. <laughs> yeah, don't care. Leave me alone. <laughs> but yeah. Well, isn't that, is, isn't that why they have all these adjustments so you could customize it? Well, no, they've got specific purpose you know you want it on cardioid you just want it to reject as much as possible of the room and just accept whatever's coming directly into the front of it that's what polar pattern you want 
Now, don't get me wrong, there might be instances where you want it to be omnidirectional or stereo if you've got an interview situation, something like that. I've got to be honest, I've never used any of the, any of the other polar patterns, with one exception when Anthony came over the other day. And I set it up correctly. I had it, it, He was on one side of the mic, I was on the other. I was talking to it correctly, set in stereo. It just didn't sound very good. <laughs> so I'm like, well, it didn't sound as good as if, I, if I'd have just angled it. You know, we both talked to it at a 45 degree angle in cardio. It would probably sounded better. But there we go. That's just one of those things. I think maybe people can make use of those extra polar patterns. And more often than not, having them means you get it wrong. And more often than more often than not, <laughs> people talking to the wrong part of it. So this guy who wrote the review, was his only uh, beef uh, too, too many things so it's hard just open to getting it wrong a lot of people with blue yeti sound god awful because they've just set it up incorrectly so it means that regardless of its quality you can more often than not hear a blue yeti user getting it wrong and it's sounding awful what was his favorite one if the blue yeti wasn't the one he was being paid for probably oh. <laughs> i don't think so he's pod stage or podcast stage, I think the guy's name is. No, I don't think so. He's just a, a mic obsessed guy. You know, I can totally relate. So I'm not obsessed with mics specifically, but I can obsess about <laughs> a number of other things that I could list that are like him in that regard. He's just made a YouTube show out of it. But doesn't a lot of this come to preference too? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, mics have got a particular frequency response and some of them can sound a bit more dull, dark, as he phrases it. Others can sound right, a but, bit more but to, but to his ear, right, but to his ear, based on technical equipment that can tell him what each setting does and how it registers on some kind of machine, and then he's got to say, well, I don't like the way this sounds, so, oh, I like this one. Well, yes and no. Audio fidelity has been um, quantifiable and mathematically measurable for about the last hundred years. And people are really good at it now. So you can give a mic um, frequency response. You can give it total harmonic distortion figures, its noise floor figures. You can give all of that stuff and you, give a pretty good assessment of what its fidelity would be like. Can you uh, segue with what you just said to the ballers who can't give us the measurement for the geometric horizon? Um, how, come really. we, how can we know <laughs> the mic, but we don't know? <laughs> well, yeah, it's just it's measurements, isn't it? It's nothing, some, sometimes we give off the impression that we've got to make against maths, and we haven't. You know, mathsing things that aren't real, <laughs> that we've got a problem with. And in the case of the ball earth, mathsing things that isn't real is is the case, you know me telling you the frequency response of my emperor's new microphone <laughs> you know it would be the only way i could compare it but well you know. um how about it can be no further than 1.22 miles what's that based on an apparition something that isn't real a reification a mathematical fallacy something that doesn't exist well yes but if it was real it can be no further than 1.22 miles. What, what is the 1.22 miles based on? It's the 39.59 and geometry that they claim. Yeah, so is their claim to geometry just a mistake or is it a thought experiment to begin with? It's never there to be measured. The bridge from mathematical reification into reality, or it was before the black swan. So prior to the black swan, marked with an X labelled horizon in their geometry with a tangent point drawn to it, two assert earth curve edge horizons get in the way of things in the distance, now replaced with, we don't have earth curve. Well, that's because they require the geometry and formally asserted that the geometry was your limitation of view at the horizon. Now it isn't. Well, that's the claim in the first instance. The claim is the horizon's earth curve. There it is getting in the way of stuff. It's got this limitation. You'll see it at these distances. Well, it isn't. Now they tell us it isn't because we've debunked it. Well, that's the end of the road as far as I'm concerned. You can't have it both ways. You can't both have Earth based on the fact that you see a geometric limitation to your view. And here it is in the maths. 
versus here it is in the maths. You don't see it, but I'm going to decide that your limitation of you is going to be based around it, whatever your limitations or lack thereof are. That's just a reification fallacy. Well, it would seem to me that if the Earth was curved, uh, we'd all know it, especially with the limitations put on the black by the black swan argument at the different observer heights. Yeah, if we're on a sphere, it'd be obviously and observably spherical. And there would be a geometric limitation to view because they're claiming there's a hump between you and what you see in the distance. A physical sphere hump curving away at 8 inches per mile squared. That's what they claim. Well, like a hill, if you happen to just have a hill that curved away in a perfect, uh, what would it be, parabola or whatever the squaring function gives you, you know, the, the not quite sphere shape that that maths gives you. I mean, it works up to about a thousand miles. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty. It's not really relevant. The point is that when you work out that mathematical value, you've got the earth falling away in the same rate that a hill could fall away at eight inches per mile squared. Well, if you were behind that hill, that fell away from the top and you got behind it, it would physically, geometrically, measurably be in the way. And that would just be the limitation to your view, the hill that got in your way. Well, that's what they claim Earth curve is, a hill getting in the way. But you can't see it, it's not there, it only exists in the maths, and the horizon that moves with the bloody weather is going to be mathematically based on it and hopefully sometimes it will match up. It's pure nonsense and fantasy. The idea that we've got a sphere edge for a horizon. We haven't. We're told we haven't. But it is definitely the basis of their religion that they're on a sphere. But it's a model, right? Because I'm thinking about it as you're saying it. And there's no way that Earth does that. But they are just talking about the model that's supposed to do that, correct? No. It's a trans transposition from model to reality with the word horizon. Their argument, Neil, starts at the horizon. Well, if you want to rephrase that into their reification of a ball earth belief starts with the horizon, then that's the way that they take their maths into reality. We've said it many times, but that's where John, who's on the panel now, transitioned from globe to flat. Because if you haven't got something to measure, you can't assert you've got measurements. You can't. I don't know how much more we can dumb it down. You know, to be on a ball, you've got to be able to measure being on a ball. They claim they can measure being on a ball, but yet they've now got something that's an apparition rather than a tangent point. So that's the end of the geometric claim. That's it. It's game over. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's not in reality. So I don't understand what's keeping people. Like, it don't work. I think I know. They're, they're not thinking about it. Um, I talked to someone at 24 seven um, and I, he said refraction and everybody was wanting to argue with him about refraction. And I was like, no, that's fine. Let him say refraction. I said, now let's go back to the measurement. And he's like, well, I've already addressed that. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> so it's like, they're not thinking about it. That's where it all, that's where the problem could be solved with the measurement. No, we measure it flat. That's that's their problem. You correct, and it'll solve their problem. That's why they don't want to look at it, I guess. But I mean, come on. I think this is something potentially we could discuss on the live show because, like with the video that I'm going to release tonight, yesterday, if you're not a member, if you're watching this, um. After 18 renditions of the same response that debunked the guy's claim, every single time listening back to it, although I didn't heavily edit it, I edited out some swears, um, it was being, how did I phrase it at the time? It fell on deaf ears. So there's a moment where, there are moments where the guy pauses, he's heard my response, and there's like a switch that flicks it gets disregarded out of hand and then he moves on with his point that he's been trying to move on and he's just objecting that he's not being allowed to. And the reason he isn't being allowed to is because he isn't responding to the initial response that's debunked what he's claimed. He just wants to plough through. Now, that's a problem. You're saying, John, well, they, they don't hear it. They don't get it. Well, 
having had it paraphrased to them, obviously the same thing is applying and has applied for the last 18 months. Neil saying, well, why don't they get it and then convert, basically? Why don't they realise it's untenable now? You can't have a sphere-Earth belief without a sphere-Earth horizon. That's what the claim is based on. Well, yeah, so how do you get around it? Or how, in discussion, do you get to the point where you say, what you are now doing is literally ignoring me? You know, there's, like with that guy, there's a short pause, and then what's been said in response is ignored. How do you get around that? Let me ask you a question, Nathan. What do you think, what's his name? Uh, not Sam Rye, the other guy that comes in. The guy you're talking about. What do you think he was going to say in that next 10 seconds? I know you know. I, I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. Because once the claim that has been made is invalid, and our, our, or my position is to get across to an audience that with this word science... You can grease the skids of a story that isn't true. And in, here was the perfect example. That's why I let it drag out as long as it did. He's saying, here's a just-so story. We go, okay, that's a just-so story laced with fallacy. Here are the fallacies. Here's how your story used that fallacy. And he goes, no, science. Now, at that point, I lost my rag and get very cross. And I'm like, that, what an outrage. You get proven to have just-so stories based on presupposition, and then you get the reply it's science then you're into demonstrating why it's not science that's where you get your 18 renditions of what you're claiming because you've got a ball belief attached to the end of it isn't science now he just wants to carry on and justify the begging the question fallacy he's calling science yeah and there's just no way i'm going to let that 10 seconds of whatever he's going to say i mean we got to the point where i think he was saying the constants are causing the variable and the final question he got before he rage quit was, what is a constant variable? Meaning something that can be varied but is kept constant so it doesn't affect the outcome of the test. In other words, to claim, as he did in his final rebuttal before rage quitting, that his constants are affecting the variable. In other words, I'm going to use that part of the scientific method to claim Earth is a constant. It's like, well, then it's not part of your validation process it's not the effect you're trying to induce or the thing you're varying to induce it it's something that's being kept constant to not affect anything but he's obviously claiming it as a causal relationship with the very thing he's trying to massage into science well i wasn't going to let him i didn't care if it took 18 attempts and we found out why you know about rendition 10 he said but it is science in other words he still wants to believe that because someone else has told him with this magic trick Here's an explanation of how we get a radius value. They've told him with a load of presuppositions laced in. He's not recognised them. He's parroted them back to me because it made sense to him. He told me that he's going around the circuit putting it out to others. He has all the presuppositions pointed out to him, all of which, which is my point here, fell on deaf ears. So you're like, okay, every time you receive anything that counters your current standpoint, your current position, it's ignored. And then either the claim that's made in the first instance that's been defeated, challenged, debunked, refuted, and ignored, is then moved past by way of a repetition of the original claim, ignoring the devastating point. That's what the guy kept doing. Now, occasionally along that path, he's going to concede certain points that make it clear to anybody with a reasonable amount of cognitive processing, you're in the wrong. In his case, he's in the wrong. You know, can you vary this variable? No, you can't. Well, it's not science then. Short pause. But I can show you how it's a constant variable or something to that effect. Whatever. It doesn't matter at that point. You know, he's just not conceding that he's using that magic trick. Just so story, presupposition, called in his words, science. It's not. It's an outrage. That's how we've all been deceived. You were like, you were, you were like that guy in the audience at a magic show that's pointing out to how the magician does his trick. <laughs> he's trying to keep doing his show going even though it's like got to be humiliating at that point. Yeah, but he but he doesn't think he's doing magic. That's the part that troubles me. Yeah, he's fell for the trick. So when someone used their magic trick on him and told him the explanation with the presuppositions in place, because he doesn't realise he's holding presuppositions as a religious fundamentalist viewpoint, he thinks that's just the way it is. So when he hears the presuppositions, nothing goes click. Oh, that's assuming the very thing that's supposed to be proving it, proven in this example here. That doesn't happen. He's just like, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, because we turn at 15 degrees an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> that's what he's done. In other words, fell for it, and then he's trying to pitch it to me. <laughs> You're like, no. It just shows your competency level when it comes to something that has been asserted to you. And presumably he's been told it's science, and he has fell for that magic trick. When it comes to somebody actually saying, well, okay, if this is science, how is it science? Well, it isn't. It doesn't have a variable that's capable of being varied to prove it as the cause. You're saying Earth turn causes these things, sunsets. Well, okay, if that's the case, that's your cause. To be science, you need to vary and manipulate that cause to prove it does cause the effect. And you can't, therefore not science. 18 renditions later, if I get 10 more seconds, I'll just be able to explain how I get around this problem of it not being science. You know, that's how it goes on. Because he still wants to believe it's science. Because it can't possibly be the case that a flat earther, with a contrasting view to his own, could prove him wrong. No, he's been told it, it's science, so it is. I was told. <laughs> no, it isn't. Sorry. Yeah, I thought I thought he was going to calculate. I thought he was going to go to calculations with the sun and prove that. And that's what he considered varying and manipulating the earth through calculations. He tried to, but he couldn't get that geometry. He was having a on the Hey, Nathan, can you go to Master Bear? I got four pictures of uh, sea level photography. And But we're starting in 60 seconds. Did you want to do it on the live yeah, show? quick. Oh, no, be quick. Well, it's up to you. Okay, go. <laughs> All right, so first one you see is fogged in. So you're going to say, oh, there's the horizon because I can't see anymore. The second one, there is no fog, and it's still level, sea level. The third one, same thing, very close to the shore. We, If the earth was a ball, we'd see a curve. And the last one is through a wave, and you could see the rest of the ocean until the wave reaches there is level. Water finds its level. That's why it's sea level, and that's why the earth is flat. Do you want the other three? Oh, I was just commenting on all of them. I thought you were keeping up. <laughs> no, I said I've got 60 seconds before I'm going to start a live show. <laughs> i'll put them all on screen one after the other now though so just so the audience can actually see them in the pre in the pre-show when this goes out good no stuff problem. thank you very much 10th right. my bad for babbling on about people not conceding that's what the problem is so it's not babbling on no the... forward no, that was a good segment there that he did because they want to own the word science, but when it comes to taking us through the process, they 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 can't even keep up with the proper way. Let's Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now, we are joined by Adam, father of a stolen child, Neil, Tenth Man, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome, one and all. 
Morning, good morning. Afternoon. Hey, good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Very enthusiastic bunch for a Friday. Excellent stuff. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon, formerly known as the curve of the Earth? Formerly known. It was never known. It was never there. It's a thought experiment. Not what I, I was think told. you'll find it was never claimed to be. Uh, uh, that's not true. Now that enough suckers have come along to tell us nobody claims the horizon is Earth curve, and we don't need tangents to do geometry... I can just say, ah, I've got hundreds of hours of people drawing tangents to horizons and doing the geometry and claiming that it's Earth curve. No, suckers. It's just nice that I can now transpose those two next to each other. You idiots drawing tangents with you idiots saying the horizon's not Earth curve. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, well, <laughs> when you have to uh, reinterpret your position 20 different ways within a five-minute debate, uh, you know their foundation is gone. Exactly. If you've got to basically decry your own claim in the first instance and say nobody's claiming the horizon is Earth curve, then you know you've lost. And you're just riddled in cognitive dissonance at that point because presumably you're still defending a dying position. Nevertheless, any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? Hello, everyone. Hey, Owen. Hello, oh, um... Hey, Dave as well. Me. Not from Nottingham. I haven't seen Dave Racky alive for a long time, although I have been listening to his antics on various other platforms. Good to have you. Mm. Yeah, it's Dave good here. But jolly good. Axial rotation, anybody at all? I'm on, I'm on the case for him. I'm, I'm still trying to tie in why we don't see it with why we claim it. Or Go why on, they Ryan. claim it. Well, they uh, have it in their mind. Any... Go on, Ryan. Go. I was just saying it's not there by any means, man. It ain't going to ever be there. Earth is flat. And stationary. Definitely not turning. And stationary. You got it. You're never going to get there, by the way, other John. You're not going to tie a claim of no drift to the assertion that Earth's proven to spin with drift. It's just paradoxically never going to happen. I just want to try to use the black swan against it. <laughs> You're going to have to settle for using it for the nonsensical we wouldn't expect to see drift because of conservation of angular momentum. You're just going to have to accept that you can use the black swan at this stage to debunk their nonsensical rebuttal. But... Well, the conservation of angular momentum doesn't apply to gases at all. I mean, it's difficult enough to get them to tie to the claim that we have a non-inertial spinning reference frame turning beneath an inertial reference frame to give us drift. That would be Coriolis effect on an Earth that's claimed to be turning with that drift that's claimed to prove it's turning. It's hard enough to get them to tie to that claim in the first instance to maybe segue into, I don't know, the non-inertial turning reference frame that we're a part of as we observe things drift has a 15 degrees an hour deviation with an R value that you could measure in terms of its spin rotation value that's claimed at what is it 24,000 you know you can you can assert these things but you can't even get them to tie to their own claim with Coriolis because it's so nonsensical because you don't see it happen there's no natural observed drift so you can't, they won't even get them to tie to that claim you know Neil deGrasse Tyson will claim it so Arwen uh, when you said conservation momentum doesn't apply to gas can you expand on that please a little further oh boom boom all right yeah 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 Oh, oh, that was a pun. It was a good question also. Nice. Uh, yeah, gases only change basically where they are due to local pressure dynamics. So if there's a local pressure, then it's going to basically displace itself based on that local pressure situation. And that's the only thing that actually makes gas move. It's just the pressure differential locally. Uh, things that don't move it are th momentum. It, like liquids and solids that actually get caught up in momentum, right? You throw them, whatever, they keep moving. They retain the motion, conservation of momentum. Well, gas doesn't do that. It only responds to the local pressure dynamics. 
So it can so, never move in in rotation at a constant rate with anything. Let's go in a quick question. Has, has Arwen been watching Dr. John D's most recent series? If not, I'll plug it because it's perfect here. Have you been watching that, Arwen? Uh, not recently. Well, it came out about two or three weeks ago. Uh, I, I, I could have watched it. I don't remember a lot of things. Uh, well, I'll just refer to it. So it, check out um, her, Dr. John D's presentations when he's talking about uh, mass and energy and work being done, disequilibrium in systems, things of that nature. It's got a four-part series on it. It's, it's excellent. Very, very, um, what's the word? Thought-provoking. Cool. Then why does it stop at Mount Everest? Doesn't. That's what I was told. It stops it at Mount stop. Everest. What do you mean stop what? at Mount Everest? It doesn't stop at Mount Everest. Because there's no, there's no oxygen that goes further than Mount Everest. It just stops there. Oxygen's part of the gas anywhere. The, the, it doesn't suddenly separate out into different mixture. You know, it's all mixed up. It's an anisotropic, inhomogeneous mixture of gases. Now, the quantities become less as you go higher, as it's dispersed, exactly as you would expect. But it's not going to reach equilibrium for it to all be a unified pressure. It's a dynamic system. However, all of these discussions that would require containment in the first instance hence the question any examples of gas pressure without a container second law of dynamic doesn't apply to the earth we've been waiting for that one for a while uh, i remember back in the day qe used to say what okay where's gravity the the strongest and they'll say uh, on earth on near the surface where it's you know being produced. Oh, okay. Well, if we can't keep it down here, how do you think it's it's keeping it up up there? So it's like, come on, guys, show us gas pressure without a container, and then that's a new starting point. But until then, it's over. And beyond your fundamentalist religious assertion that the sky is a vacuum. So going outside and saying, look, we've got gas pressure, therefore the sky is a vacuum. That's called a begging the question fallacy. Indeed, and if know, I if I may, know it's not different up there. If I may input something, uh, on top of that, if if ballers have some kind of question, like why doesn't the gas just uniformly spread around and all that, right? Originally, I thought oh maybe relative density causes it to to layer it out a little. It's very unlikely though. What is more likely is it can be demonstrated on the small scale. If you have a container, you. I have a cooling element on one side of the container and a heating element on the other side of the container, a gradient even within a smaller container will start to form because of the temperature influences. So gradients can definitely be formed in containers, even on the small scale. And since we know there is heat at the surface here and not up there, there's nothing really to absorb it, then yeah, we could see that there is a temperature influence, which would likely, the most likely, be the cause of the gradient within the realm. Any evidence? I don't know. Things could be different up there because you got a rocket that's going to crash soon. I just seen it on the news. No, the sky is not a vacuum. If the sky was a vacuum, it would be a space. How ironic that they call it space for the gas we breathe to fill, and we'd all be dead. Nathan, what? did you see the size of this rocket? <laughs> don't worry about. Down right but it's massive, down. Nathan. It's massive. <laughs> the, don't well, worry I, about uh, go on john let's say uh nasa is recreating the armageddon movie and claiming it's in real life i don't know if anybody's keeping up with that that's but, how they uh, do it they have it's a, called it's called predictive programming have you never heard of predictive programming are they gonna send bruce willis hold on that would be awesome if i say the term hold on if I, hold on if i say the term predictive Programming, does that hold any meaning for anyone on the panel? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Inserting okay, information in a time when the subject is very unlikely to have a conscious understanding of it so that they would still, in their subconscious, have that information for later purposes. Yeah. If, you, if you're unfamiliar well, with an audience member, type in subliminal messaging or predictive programming into YouTube. For more information.
There you go. Distance well, sun. let's get Anybody? back to the point. Um, oh, right, if you on. have a, a vacuum of space, as they say, and no barrier between that and gases, we all know already what happens. It fills the available space. They got to show the opposite, the contra. They can't do it. Not without begging the question and appealing to their fundamentalist religious belief that we have gas pressure and the sky is a vacuum, which is predominantly the claim in the first instance, hence me pointing out as begging the question fallacy. But by contrast, we could actually do the exact same thing and claim that we have containment. Now, I don't do that intentionally, but I don't decry anybody who does. Go outside, we've got gas pressure. Well, the necessary antecedent would be a container then. So there's no unreasonable nature in terms of making that assumption and logical inference i just force my opponent to make it it's like oh, i make that claim i've said the sky is not a vacuum because it's a space for gas to fill it's the v in gas law so that's the volume well that's how much space the gas has got to fill so we can calculate the entropy increase well that's because it's a law of nature gas would fill the space so gas would fill space so space is space, well, we will be dead. Isn't that the point of debate? When one side gets to say what they want, the other side comes with a rebuttal and back and forth, and you can see right away who's being unreasonable? It just means I don't have to make the positive claim so they get to burn a straw man. And so prove your container. So, well, the positive assertion in that claim, if somebody has made that claim, is kind of irrelevant because that's one man's assertion versus the entire Western world that are under the misapprehension the sky is a vacuum. And that is the extraordinary claim, the positive claim in the first instance. However, the moment somebody says, well, antecedent consequent relationship, therefore a container, they'll just hold you to that indefinitely rather than deal with the awkward detail about the sky vacuum not being real. Because it's far easier to debunk one man than it is to defend the Western worldview that stands in violation of the second law of thermodynamics and gas law. Is this why the in chat, when you post a remark to one of your shows, you get inundated with people saying, show us the flat earth model, show us your model. You ain't got a model. Until you have a model, it's not real. Is this is this tied into all that? Well, it's, yeah, it's a false dichotomy fallacy and straw man fallacy. So they want to burn your contrary opinion to their positive claim rather than defend their positive claim in the first instance so rather than because the majority of the western world just accept that they're on a sphere to them it seems reasonable not realizing the fallacy they'll say oh yeah well obviously we're on a sphere it's therefore up to you to disprove that extraordinary claim and you're like really well okay i'll disprove it then no 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 Actually, I've changed my mind. It's not up to you to disprove our claim. It's up to you to defend a claim you haven't made about a model you don't create, but you've been given on your journey through flat Earth now, haven't you? You've been given this azimuth equidistant globe projection that's flat. Now, defend that as your bloody model so I can debunk it and show how my globe projection is better than your globe projection because then the deck's definitely stacked in my favour as we have this discussion. Yeah, but when you're uh, discussing this, hold on a second. All right. When you're discussing this, it's it's nice because you go back and forth and one side could say, I don't know what the sky is, but I do know to have pressure, you got to have containment. And that cannot be overcome because that's what we do know. Yeah, the sky is not a vacuum. If it was, we'd all be dead. The gas we breathe would fill the space. Worse than that, though, you got this guy, Ed Freeze. He thinks he's got you over a battle. Now, I can listen to the whole thing and just hear him getting torn apart. But in his mind, he's got you over a battle and you're losing. No, ballers, ballers can't use barrels. That's a container. He ran for it. <laughs> He rage quit. What are you talking about? Deletion. When Nathan identified what he was doing, he rage quit. Yeah, and he still claims victory, though. Of course. The irrelevant. <laughs> just, just on something irrelevant, Owen, you meant chocolate mentioned Armageddon there. Um, and I, I just thought I'd see if they are faking it. But what I did stumble across was, was this statement. Quite funny. 
Uh, NASA often shows the movie Armageddon as part of its management training program and asks its new staff to find as many scientific inaccuracies as they can. In brackets, there are at least 168. But there's more. Uh, really? <laughs> Holy shit. Told you. That's funny. I thought the well, yeah. movie was inaccurate. When we look at the NASA material, we find 1168. Oh, I just have I just have one that debunks every claim they've made ever, which is that the sky is not a vacuum because it stands in violation of the second law of thermodynamics. So every single claim ever made or assertion made from that area, in that instance, the majority of the movie Armageddon takes place in an area that doesn't exist, a second law of thermodynamics violation sky vacuum where they're travelling to get to a rock in the sky vacuum. Yeah, that's all fake. The entirety of it is fake. Yeah, but Chocolate has stories he's told us where he shows the Tesla car in the violation of outer space. And people are saying, nah, that's a joke. No, nah, no one's doing that. So when, when you reverse this, instead of asking NASA to spot errors and just ask the public, they do the same thing with NASA footage. I don't know. I could get there. We could get there. That's and, part of that. If there's a firmament, we could get there. Can't get there what they claim it is because space is fake with their claim. But my claim, it's inside the firmament. So why couldn't we go there? They, they want whoever's partaking in that sort of questionnaire to come up with answers that work within the begging the question fallacy. So, for example, they would want them to answer along the lines of, when detailing how to resolve this problem, one of them comes up with a mylar sail and says it will catch cosmic winds. Well, obviously they're in a vacuum and that wouldn't work because, and then give an explanation within an Einsteinian paradigm. And that would be an acceptable answer. An unacceptable answer would be to say, everything claimed in that movie that didn't take place on the ground, terra firma, was fake because the gas breathed in the parts where they were on the ground, terra firma, wouldn't be there if they could just travel out into an area that was of a lower pressure, because every bit of gas that we are breathing would fill that space. Therefore, everything claimed in the movie is wrong, beyond anything claimed on the ground. If they can, dra if they can drag you into your, their imagination, then they've already won half the battle. If they can get you into a place that doesn't exist then they're almost there the top John... answer sums it up for me nathan now it says sir about halfway through the movie my pen died so i made a mental list of the things that actually are accurate in the movie number one asteroids rockets and nuclear weapons are real thing things number two we as an organization are capable of launching teams of humans into space then number three, St Stephen Tyler does not want to miss a thing. So I don't know what that one is, but you're right there. Because yeah. I miss you, baby. Yeah. Anyway. I don't want to miss a thing. Nobody answered my question. What was your question, Neil? Heliocentric model? Yeah, you can't go there. But if there is a firmament and we are enclosed... The sun, the moon, and the stars are inside the firmament. Why can't they go there? Could they be traveling there and just telling us something that it's not? Sorry, what makes you think I'll allow? Oh, uh, uh, do we know that? Oh, that, yeah, exactly. What makes you think I'd be any less or any more lenient with you, when Neil, when you beg the question in three different instances? I right, name one, because I said there's a firmament. The Bible says there's, there's a one. firmament. There's one. That's one. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm a Bible believer, so the Bible says there is. And you can't have gas pressure out of container, so there's something containing us. But the sun, the moon, and the stars are claimed to be inside the firmament. There's number so two. So why can't we travel to them? There's number two. Uh, well, I what are the stars that? other than luminaries? And what is the firmament exactly? Does it Whatever also you... say that? Uh -huh. Does it give you the technical specs? Whatever the... you do, Neil, when you travel there, please don't put your phone on the dash.
That was his. That was his third <laughs> assumption. Travel there. What do you mean travel there? So their physical locations. Oh, uh, it's got to be somewhere. I'm uh, at I, I got what do you mean? Got to be just because you have got a hat trick of presuppositions. Don't fundy mute me, Neil. Just because you're getting told off for begging the question. Do I see the sun? Does everybody see the sun in the Don't moment? try and now take me through your logical inference steps. No way. Okay, I see the sun. I see the moon. Oh, he's going to do it anyway. I can get Neil, there. Neil, Neil, <laughs> Neil, you're going to start getting pegged as a fundy. Don't have to like it. <laughs> well, I know you're serious. That's what. Oh, God. Yeah. Seriously triggered. Fundamentalist. Well, I, I, I think I can help with this one. Neil, I see a rainbow. Can I get to the pot of gold? You get to the rainbow. Yeah. Well, the rainbow is uh, it's optical, isn't it? I see it. It's there. Oh. I can get to it. Oh. Let me explain my logical <laughs> inference. That's my question. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Give me it. ten more seconds, Neil. Explaining how I can get to the rainbow. Give me ten more seconds. Yeah, but the rainbow is an optical. Oh, yeah. The sun is optical too. I don't know if it's Yeah, right. you're muttering quite a lot there, Neil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> probably probably best to give up at this stage before we start asking Can't about Can't have distance. a rainbow without the sun, Neil. Come on, keep it yep. up. Well, nice segue. Sun... Any evidence of the distance to the sun as we've spent quite a long time on gas pressure without a container? I give up. Good. Don't beg the question here, Neil. You know, right. you're going to get I told off. I don't think we could get there. It's just you could. I knew I could hear it in the tone of your voice that you were itching to just go back into what is basically, I don't have to say it, but babbling fundamentalist chanting rhetoric. So you know you don't get to beg the question here, Neil, even if you're on my panel. Sorry, I'm not sorry. But you're not listening to me. That's the problem. <laughs> you just need ten more seconds, outside. right? I, I'm not I'm letting not you get to the end where you explain you're begging the question fallacy in detail and I'm, tell me how I should I'm accept not, it. I'm not saying the heliocentric model. Forget about that. I look up and I see the sun and the moon. Is that a new religion? What, what are you going to call on, it? Tim. I know. <laughs> Neil, we heard. Now, Please, can we move on? This is, you see, it's human nature. Yeah, chanting. Be doing what Neil's doing. It's not a baller trait. It's a human nature trait. Fine. <laughs> it's tough to like it. If you want to talk. I will get there. I will get there somehow. Voice him in. I'll get there. You don't understand. <laughs> Sorry, continue the show. Well, I'm not talking about the heliocentric version of what's going on. I'm talking about what I see. I okay. know you can't have guests especially out of container. I Can you get to the horizon? Can you get to the horizon? Thank you. Let's move on. Well, Any yeah, evidence on. at the distance? <laughs> oh, God, we've got somebody shut him up. Neil, please, please. <laughs> Any evidence at the distance to the sun? No, but I'm going to find out one day. <laughs> it's over there. Neil, your car doesn't even go 20 miles without a problem. Good luck. Actually, it's been good, except for the water coming in when it rains. <laughs> it's over there. In a way, I'm pleased, Neil. You know, you, me getting the opportunity to tell someone on my own side off for begging the question is just useful to certain audience members that think that you get an easy ride if you're on the flat earth side of the argument. No. <laughs> Chat crap. Can, can I Neil? A torch. Go ahead. Because um, Neil's Neil's forming is as he states at the beginning is a Christian, and he's I think we're mixing up belief of what we know as fundamentally true, and how Neil is then putting that into his belief of the world around him, and he's using scripture to fill in the gaps. Um, there's no problem with that, but keep it as your belief um, and understand the bits that Scripture's filling the gaps in for, is all I'd say. Uh, yeah, there is a problem. If you keep it as your belief, fine. I've got beliefs, you've got beliefs about what's up there, uh, but we don't make statements and validate them with Scripture because that's... I don't know, Adam. Um, uh, uh, no, 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 no. I just got to correct that. Sorry. Uh, hold on. Hold on. No. no. So ask Arwin if that's acceptable, and no, Arwin knows full well that, oh, well, if I just declare it as a belief, that'll get me off the hook. No. 
No, people yeah, are just going to kill you for that. Any, no, look, the point is, it doesn't really matter whether you're a flat earther on this side or a baller on that side. Begging the question will inevitably lead to intellectual poverty. That's a real fist. I would put that in chat too. I would type that in chat too. How am I begging a question? Oh God, Neil's still chanting, asking how he's begging the question. Neil. Neil. Let, let me tell him. Let me just tell him because he'll never shut up otherwise. Let me just tell him. The problem is when you said, wait, uh, if the sun and the moon are in the firmament, right? How do we know that? I see your point. I got you. Yeah. You. If you claim his firmament, Neil, right? That's the thing that you want to be the thing that's real. And what you, where you segued was from, well, we, we can't have gas pressure without a container. Yeah, that's a true enough statement. Therefore, my firmament... Whoa, 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 whoa there. Oh, boy, what are you doing? <laughs> and inside your firmament, you say... No. Well, can I, can I, you, I add to that, Neil? Can I add to that, Neil? Hold on, I can just I... say it's scripture. Hold on, Eli. Go ahead, Neil. No, I'm just saying, I did say it's scripture. I did say the Bible, according to the Bible, there is a firmament and these things are inside the firmament. That's all I'm saying. Right. What's what's the religion that's got the the God that stretches over us as a roof? What's that? What's that Egyptian. religion? The Rakia. Is it, I thought Christian. it was Rakia. It's I thought Egyptian. it was Rakia. But... Rakia means roof. But nevertheless, it's there's a God that's stretched over that holds... It's no, the it. Egyptian God. Yeah, I think it's Egyptian. But my point is that me Egyptian God, therefore gas pressure without a container, therefore me Egyptian God container, Neil. Same principle. I got you. It, it, works, for the, also, it, it works for the Egyptians because mummy takes care of everything. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> also, also, okay, I got double plated glass. I'm standing on one side. You're standing on the other side. I flick on a flashlight. Boom. The circle of light is set in the glass. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So we can't even, we, but we don't know what the sun is, so we don't know either way. How do I even know what I, I mean, you know? Well, I think that's what, um, this is where a place when I even would say, look, uh, we have scripture that tells us uh, how, the God of the Jews and Christians describes creation. Now, if you say this is a physics show and we need the scientific method for the things that are in nature naturally occurring for, to figure out a cause, this is why we're strong here on the show. And then you bring in uh, where is the sun? How does it work? I mean, none of us could go do any of those things and be valid on this show. So as a Christian myself, I'll say, well, uh, I believe the scriptures account. Now, you may have a different opinion, but this is what I believe. Now, can I go prove that belief? Can I get into some kind of uh, vehicle and travel to it? Uh, you know, I, I mean, scratching the surface for dollars just to take a vacation these days, let alone put out on some expedition like that. So, again, there's some things we're never going to know because we don't have the means to go and set the control variables and, you know, manipulate something. But, uh, but Tim, hold on, wasn't there a time when people thought about that way? Wasn't there a time when people thought about that with the sky as well? Well, that's the point. That's the beauty of what when Nathan says, when he realized it was a big lie, he became like a kid again. And now wonderment, like, I wonder what it is. I wonder how it works. Right. And so uh, for the Christians, that's solved. Uh, and for others, they're, they're wondering. The no, I'm saying they thought they could never fly. We, we can fly, right? We can travel with a plane in the air. So all yeah, the time that's we can't just go that, up another level. That's technology. And so we can do a lot of things. There's cars that go 200 plus miles an hour now that, I mean, the Ford Model T was, was okay, before, looking before like we a go, standing hold still. On, hold on, 10th, before we go off on this segue. So you know, there is one point I definitely agree with you. You know, we're like, we've got different branches or different arms of the argument and it does make us stronger, like the strength offered by the many arms of Ganesh. 
And I agree with you on that point. Shut up, Nathan. <laughs> Anyway, there's some things that we're still trying to figure out, and that's just the way it's going to be because we're the creation. We're not the creator. Correct, but at one correct, but at one time the creation did not even think they could fly in the air. But Fine. They can. Fine, so what but what does that mean? That means. There? So what does that mean? So why means, can't we get to the next level? Well, it's, it's okay. Quite well, maybe maybe we can fly higher. higher. Neil doesn't know that. Neil does not know. What, what do you believe in evolution or something where humans are too stupid to figure these things out? Or do you think it's just what, what they evolved in? Oh, now we know how to fly. How, how do you think it happened? I think Neil's No, I'm saying it. there had to be a time I, when people didn't think they could fly in the air. Like, how do you know that? But yeah, yeah. Just, uh, well, no, you look, know I think not. Neil's point is we're, much we're, more simplistic than that. It's look, they used to say it couldn't be done. They couldn't fly. And now Allah be praised. We can. Hold on. No, we're not flying. The plane is. Correct. But you're right. in the plane. So what's the difference? So you go a little you're... higher, a little higher, <laughs> what's a little the higher. Difference? And then you're on the moon, playing golf. <laughs> who's, the, who's the guy that got swallowed by a whale? Did you get pedantic about him not swimming? Jonah. Jonah? Who is riding in chariots of fire? Jonah. Uh, anyway, oh, uh, no. yes. right. Elijah. By the many arms of Ganesh, can we please change the subject? Right. I Any scientific evidence of gravity? Something funny happened on it? the way to the moon. <laughs> I don't mind discussing that. Uh, what's the guy's name? Bart Sibral or Bart Sibral, depending on how you want to say it. Yeah, but he recanted, didn't he? His copyright struck me once, bastard. Yeah, he recanted a lot of the things he said, which I don't find him genuine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> what, what do you mean he recanted? What did he recant? Google it. Google it. That's epic, Neil. Thank you. So detailed. So you nice. retracted statements? Or... I, I've, I've heard him say um, that he believes the earth is a sphere but i don't have him ever recanting what his uh, main work was which was you know the fa the phony mission i'm gonna have to find it, it was on jaronism and uh there was a few things that he i don't mm -hmm. know if they put pressure on him or whatever but he recanted a lot of things he didn't actually say they didn't go to the moon can't put pressure mm -hmm. on the guy unless he's in the container so i wouldn't worry about it Right. Well, he probably seen that flat earthers were using um, some of the things he put out, and then he thought that he was being associated with us, so he recanted. Yeah, he was, but for all the wrong reasons. Reasons that I think play into the heliocentric argument in the respect that if you want to argue about whether or not you can leave low Earth orbit or whether or not rockets work in space. Well, all of those arguments are under the presupposition that you've got a sky vacuum in violation of natural law. So it's quite useful to have those arguments. There's no reason why you shouldn't put out a bit of conspiracy, control the opposition narrative, and give you know somebody who's reasonably well acquainted but not necessarily well known in the mainstream media, give him it. Let him go to town on it. Then you've got control over it. The best way to control a rebellion is to lead it yourself. Right. Don't let the rebellion get hold of, well, your entire area that you're claiming to operate in is vague. It's in violation of natural law. You can't have gas pressure not fill a volume. That's nonsense. Much better to say, put out a narrative that says they didn't leave the orbit of Earth. Because then we're begging the question of a sphere Earth and things falling around it in a sky vacuum. And that's all cushy, right? Excellent. Wash that out. Doesn't this? Doesn't this? Well, don't ask us. We 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 were just passengers taking a ride, right? And don't ask us. They, yeah, they, they were both. That one. They were both passengers taking a ride and simultaneously navigating using the stars that they both could and could not see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> doesn't I sound think... very commanding for somebody who's 
on the greatest mission in human history, huh? I think they were left in a very I... awkward position. You know, there's a reason why they look like someone just took a shit in their cornflakes when they're going for the public press conference after the fact. That's because they know they're lying at that point. Now, prior to that, if you see them doing tests, especially Armstrong, man, he was well into it. Keen. And I honestly believe that they thought they were going to the moon. And at some point, they were told, sorry, lads, <laughs> what we're going to do is the old switcheroo. <laughs> we're going to send off this half-scale rocket, right? And we're going to film it from a distance. You'll be back at home. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to pre-film it. We'll broadcast it on this screen. We'll get the press to film it. And we'll get the screen to be a third generation image. So it's not the original. It's a recording of the original played through a television screen, filmed with a video camera, broadcast onto a projection screen, and then filmed by the TV. And that's what they'll get. And no one will know the difference. Don't forget Nixon making a phone call that locked it in. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll hide you in the basement and portray you guys as heroes to the entire world. <laughs> and Nixon used a landline, Neil. Yeah. Nixon locked it in with that phone call. Someone sat in that press conference with a pen and paper and went, more enthusiasm. And then they've gone into a training. He's gone into sort of NASA propaganda training. And when the guys who are now doing the propaganda, you know, the younger crowd, whenever anything happens that's purely CGI and represented with some ones and zeros going up some, <laughs> some employee screen... Whenever anything is supposed to happen and the narrator says, and now something has happened, they all go, woohoo, jump in the air and show totally the opposite end of the scale to, you know, Neil and Buzz. <laughs> At that so, press so conference, it's completely the reverse so, end of the scale now. So what you're saying is the people who, who never claim to go to the moon are bored, disenchanted, and the people who are on Earth and never gone to the moon, woo wee, did you see that? Exactly. I was thinking of uh, trying to get some people together to fake going to the second law of thermodynamics violation to portray the Earth as flat. So when the Globers try to debunk us, they're actually debunking NASA too by proxy. I see. I think they've Which pretty are... much pumped enough money into that endeavor. Which brings me to a question I was going to ask John a minute ago on the previous subject. So, John, uh, the surveyors, they know they're measuring on a plane. So this is a, a good time for you to chime in uh, as to how you look at this, because they know what they're looking at and measuring, and yet they hold a belief. Yeah. Yeah. All we have is measurements of it flat. And then there was a belief that the dip angle you could draw an orthographic view was to a geometric position you could measure. You know, that was the belief. But with the black swan and, you know, fine, say refraction to it all you want. But you're no longer measuring a dip angle to a geometric position at that point. And you're admitting it when you say refraction. And what is a dip angle, John? Um, What's an angle? Like uh, you, if you drop a plumb line and then you draw a 90 degree out from your eye line, there's an apparent difference between that 90 degree and the horizon. Would that be a perpendicular? Yeah, between the perpendicular from your eye and that plumb, there appears to be a difference. And you know, that dip okay. angle makes the third line, so you need a triangle, triangle, three straight lines? Yeah, yeah. It's, the you know, Pythagorean theorem is based on having three straight lines to make a triangle. Can you get an angle with one of those lines being curved? I need a citation that triangles are three uh, straight uh, lines. Uh, hold on. Uh, one of them isn't in what he's just described. So you drop your plumb, right? 
that takes you to the center of the presupposed spherical Earth. Then you take your line from a high altitude. So in Al-Biruni's description, to clear that problem, he goes up to the top of a mountain and then measures his dip angle, as described by John, to the tangent point. That's Earth curve, edge horizon, right? And then he can derive with the trig what the R value would be. Uh, yeah, but the problem with that is uh, that measurement comes from a presupposed globe radius at the center. No one's taking a measurement of a presupposition from the center of anything. The actual measurement was from a mountain. No, correct. He's going to minus that off at the end. So he's going to minus off wherever his height is. But that over when you were the point that I interjected was because you're saying, well, where's he going to get the, the third line from for his for his triangle? Well, one will go from the center of the presupposed spherical Earth to the tangent point. One will go up through the mountain to his original plumb line that he's going to presuppose is dropped to the center of a presupposed spherical Earth, including the height of the mountain. But then when he's looking down from the mountain to the tangent point formerly known as Earth curve, that's one straight line. And then from the tangent point to the center, that's two. And then from the center to the top of the mountain is three. So he's, he's acquired a triangle to do no, my question, to get the R. No, my question wasn't that. My my question was, they are using a triangle. To have a triangle, it requires three straight lines. And then they take that. So my thing is, what is a triangle? And then they take that and say, well, we can do that if you allow us to make one of them go to the center of something we can't prove. Well, yeah, because that's the only place on a circle on, that you draw on a two-dimensional piece of paper, right? And then you can say, here's a circle, it's 360, and here's the center, and from here to any point on that circle is, this, is the radius. I, and I've for got you Earth, Dave... I, I see your point. What, what you're saying is, even though he's measuring or claiming to do the trig by way of dropping a plum, drawing an imaginary 90 degrees, measuring the difference between that and the horizon... All of that assumes there is an acquirable R value in the first place. So when you say he's assuming Correct. R, well, he's assuming he can get it, right? That's your point. Correct. That's why I said it was a belief. That was the belief that I held. That you well, could what's get the R. difference? Yeah, yeah, that rounds out 10th question to John perfectly. Can you repeat that, John? That was the belief I held. But I could acquire R for measurement. I, th I thought I could. Yeah. The belief, if you're a sphere believer, is that you can measure your sphere. Not only that, you've already had it measured. Here's the maths for it. Well, okay. So how do we know it's been measured and it is capable of measurement? Well, we'll compare it to photos. Well, when you do that, you're taking out all aspects of perspective, put it in an orthographic view, having the targets not change their size as they move into the distance, and claiming there's a physical reified sphere edge horizon based on an R value acquired by doing this dip angle measurement. Well, if you can't do the dip angle measurement to get the R, to get the maths, to make the claims when comparing to pictures and excluding perspective, then you've got no argument. You need to see the physical geometry and be able to measure it to make the claim that it's measurable. It isn't. Yeah, not That's a not a measurable sphere. You, 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 right. You're not measuring a hologram when you do a dip angle measurement if you believe you live on a sphere. Can you measure geometry without geometry? No, you can't calculate geometry without a geometric measurement. I mean, can you measure a rainbow? I mean... You can. It doesn't mean it's there, though. But a rainbow's so, more so tangible. Uh, 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 the rainbow's more tangible, believe it or not, than Earth curve. And I quote Rumpus. The geometric horizon, and I paraphrase in brackets, that's Earth curve, only exists in the maths. Now, a rainbow, you can at least clap eyes on it like the sun and go, there it is, there's a rainbow. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. You see it? Yeah. Can we get to it? No. Is it tangible? No. But there it is, before your very eyes. Where's Earth Curve? Well, it only exists in the mass. Well, we measure, we measure it flat. 
Yeah, the only thing we have is the measurements of flat. It, the, the... I mean, that, that's that's, that's true. They bug out when people say things like, like that. Go ahead, no. okay. That's true, but but my main point is that you can't measure a rainbow in the same sense that you can't measure light because they're saying we're not seeing anything physical. We're just seeing the aberration of it. Oh. But the claim is you can. That's the point, Eli. The claim is you can see it, measure it as a sphere with sphere parameters. Well, as soon as they say you can't measure it, well, it's not a sphere you're not measuring. You haven't got the geometry. You can't make that geometric claim. And that claim is Earth curve. Yeah, that's the main, 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 main point. You're right. Nathan, I got, I got a, a few slides in Master B to round off this point. If you can go there, please. Start with the celestial horizon with the airplane uh, image of the Earth. Hold on a sec. I just want to say one more thing. When they say refraction, um, they just want to get past that. You know, like they don't want to talk about it anymore. They'll, they'll say refraction just to block it out of their mind. But they'll never go back to the measurement after they say refraction. Yeah, that's why it's fun to rub but it in their faces. That's why refraction, because they fun have no rub... measurement. That's why it's fun to rub it in their faces now. So, yeah, you definitely claim it. Here it is. Here's you personally claiming it in the case of some of them. Well, yeah, they would, they would rather argue about refraction for 10 hours than address what their claim of refraction does to their previous claim. While well, rubbing it in it. their face, you're not respecting authority. Okay, 10th, I've got your celestial horizon. Uh, with Perfect. The, yeah, go ahead. All right, so what you see here in the image is the presupposed sphere that we live on. You see at the equator, your horizontal line. You see on the surface your horizontal line. And if you're in an airplane, the same horizontal line. Now, in an airplane, they use a bubble sextant. It's like a spirit level in the sextant, and they level it when they take their reading. On the surface of the Earth, they use a regular sextant. And the presupposition is right there staring at you. Now, what is this picture telling you? That those lines coming in to create the angle with the uh, horizontal lines, that's the sunlight. If the sunlight hits the Earth in parallel lines, then you'll have the same angle for all three of these. Go to the next picture, please. Is the sunlight coming in parallel or divergent? Self-explanatory here. Sunlight destroys the globe model. Go to the next picture, please. As you can see here, this is my own drawing of how a sextant works. Now, a sextant works, uh, as you can see here, with a triangle. You have earth level. You have your sailboat. I've, you know, shown three here. And when the navigator pulls out his instrument, he sights the sun, brings it to the horizon, or should I say, from the horizon, they go up. They need a baseline. The baseline is zero. The section has a knob, says zero. So that plane that you're on is one of the three lines. As you can see, the sun is over somewhere on the Earth in this uh, image that I'm showing. And that would be called the GP, geographical position, where it's the highest point over the Earth there. This is where it's directly overhead. And then you're in the sailboat, these angles away. As you can see, they're labeled. Then you go to the nautical almanac and say, well, if the sun is over there directly and I'm shooting it at this angle, and here comes your triangle, three straight lines, how many degrees, and then they convert it into miles, nautical miles, and then you know where you are in relationship to that. Next, next picture, please. It's called the circle of equal altitude. That yellow straight line coming down is the sun directly over that position on the Earth. You just don't know where you are on the circle when you s shoot it and it says 50 degrees. But it's got to be flat under you, zero, to get an angle. So wherever it is, uh, it has to be a plane that you're shooting it from. Now, 
If you want to know exactly where you're at, you can wait until the sun moves a little bit, maybe uh, over you in the sky for a couple hours or an hour, and then shoot it again. Or you can take another star, or if the moon's out that day, go to the last slide. As you can see here, this is three circles done. Now, where are you? Well, in the first circle, you're somewhere on the circle. You do the second sighting, the two circles intersect at two points. Well, you're at one of those points. Well, if you do a third, you know exactly where you are in relationship to the GP, the geographical position of, say, that star, that sun, that moon. Now, each one of those circles represents distances. So if I'm on one side of the circle and I'm shooting 50 degrees, the guy on the other side is shooting 50 degrees. If that says to me 3,000 miles, I'm 3,000 miles from where the sun is directly overhead on, on that place on the Earth, but I'm 6,000 miles away from the other guy shooting from the other side. It all has to be flat or the sextant would not work. Sextant does work. Therefore, that we don't live on a globe. That's it. Perfect. Beautiful. And we've got proven liar rumpus defender of the globe don't know why you've come back rumpus i don't know why we'd entertain you you're a proven liar claiming you did refract the horizon at the isle of man only to call me a wanker when i asked you to give me the show number when your lie wasn't demonstrated what are you even doing here you're a proven liar now you've got no credibility anymore I use the refractive conditions all the time, you tosser. You You're know a liar. I just get lost. <laughs> so I've got hundreds of hours of Rumpus drawing a tangent and claiming Earth curve geometry. Now he says, I use the refracted value all the time. Now last time he was here, it was pointed out that when he refracted the targets in respect to the horizon, making them a slightly looming non-standard refraction high in a holographic projection of a lighthouse from behind the reified sphere edge horizon. We knew what they were claiming because they drew a tangent to it, called it Earth Curve, and claimed it was proven by those discussions. Now Rumpus is a liar and says, I always refracted everything. No, he didn't. He drew tangents to the horizon. No, he didn't. Or it would have been a bent line and invalidated his geometry when he was doing it. Now he's lying. That's what this comes down to. The flat earth debate comes down to former claims made by globeheads being lied about to a live audience. I don't want Rumpus here anymore. He's a proven liar. You must think we haven't paid attention to him in the past, like, five years. I don't know what's wrong with that guy. Or, like, he don't record every show. It's yeah. crazy. Told me I had a fuzzy right? memory. Like, like, there's not a whole, like... Over thousands of episodes with this guy in it. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? The liar. That's what it boils down to now. When you've got the paradox of needing geometry, that would be a tangent, to the Earth curve horizon you claimed was blocking the Isle of Man, and we debunk it, you've got to then say, well, I always had a refracted non-geometric horizon that I couldn't have done my maths I was claiming with. Well, no, you didn't. That's a lie. And that's what they'll have to do from now on, lie. Like Rumpus. I'm not going to entertain liars here. Overt liars is at that. No, get lost. Liar. Hey, just sleepy warrior. How you doing? All the colours of the rainbow. The tangible rainbow that Neil can get to. No. No, it's a figment of your imagination, isn't it? It's an optical phenomenon. Can't really go there in a rocket. I said earlier, it's more tangible than Earth Curve, which only exists in the maths. Even though oh, we were you know claimed to be I shown have it. This, you, know, that, you know that guy that um, got, likes to call himself Professor, Professor Phil Bell, we all just call Phil. He was trying to get me to calculate something with respect to the egg in the relative density test. And I said to him, I said, the minute you start engaging maths, because the egg accelerates, which he does accept, the moment you start engaging maths, you start calculating for a force because an accelerating mass is observed. And we all know what force he's going to be calculating for. But the moment he starts applying that mathematics in the context of physics, that's where it starts going wrong. 
I said to him, I said, I'm not interested in making any mathematical calculations for you. I'm happy with manipulating the presumed cause and proving the cause of the effect and stopping at that point. I don't need to go any further. Manipulation is better than calculation. And he didn't like it. Well, you don't uh, like science, but huh? Hmm. I told him he can stick to his physics. Um, he, he also said, um, when I said about science being qualitative rather than quantitative, he come back with, yeah, yeah, there are qualitative guys in science. We, we, uh, we, uh, we leave that to the biologists in Building 7. And I was like, oh, right. I said, so the biologists are like the true scientists then? I said, like, um, be like, be like the biologists. I said, don't be like the physicists who only ever calculate stuff. We want to see the manipulation of the presumed cause, not the calculation of the effect. He didn't it, like that either. It almost sounded like he said, do we leave that to the real scientists? Then we're just yeah, going yeah. over our bullshit. That, that is what he said. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. That, that is what he said. Take another. Boy, Pete. Oh, it was John. Sorry, John. Go ahead. If he can drag you into the mathematical, then he can, um, like, that's almost like pulling you into his imagination at that point. Yeah, because if you see an accelerating mass, you've got a force, right? So let's calculate that force. And at the end of it, you're well done. You just calculated gravity. Well done. You're an intelligent boy. Shakes your, ruffles your hair and walks out the room. You've just been totally been duped. Yeah, so anyway, you're going to pull for that. And here you go, you can pass your exams if you do it properly in a formal environment. But I'm a physicist, he says. <laughs> yeah, dickhead. With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you, first and foremost, to both G Plus and Discord panels for making today's live show possible. If you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Primary Streams, however, stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on a Primary Stream. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. Sky, I wanted to tell, say, oh, this is what this is in the sky, you know. Well, most of physics is translating the physical world into into calculations. That, that in essence, is what physics really is. What physics Science deals is the experiment no, part? Physics deals with the physical. No, that's science. Yeah, physics is science. Mm. Specifically, natural science. That's what physics is. It, I'd say that physics is more about calculating everything and turning that's everything math. into a mathematical equation. Yeah, that's maths. But, but aren't you no. talking about physicists? That's theoretical physics. Didn't Rumpus say uh, science is the study of uh, numbers and shit? Uh, Adam, <laughs> you, Adam, can you just repeat yourself, please? What, what Anthony's talking about is theoretical physics, um, which is, by its definition, it has to be mathematical because it's theoretical. You no longer like when you're dealing with the stars and that, you're not able to deal with the physical anymore, hence it's preloaded theoretical physics. Um, but physics is en encompasses all of the physical chemistry and some biology um, and will use science in its discipline. Yeah, what well, the problem is it's abused, isn't it? Because what they can calculate theoretically in phys in theoretical physics becomes a synonym, a synonym, and, a, and an equal point or an, an equivalent uh, science. And it's it's the conflation of the two that's the problem. They're not the same. It's an oxymoron. Correct. Theoretically physical. It's either physical or isn't it? It's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. Studying the presumed physics of the stars, right? The presumed physical nature of them.
Well, are they? We don't know that. So it's theoretical. All right. Does that make it physical? Well, no. It's the mathematical version of how we describe what we see of the lights in the sky. If they were physical. <laughs> well, are they? Well, we say they are. Why? Well, because of our theoretical physics. <laughs> Meaning physical. <laughs> I know it's cool, uh, people is, is space time physical? <laughs> no, space time is mathematical. Purely mathematical. But that's theoretical well, how, physics. How, something, how, can, how can something mathematical do anything? Doesn't. That's the point. That's why I say I'm not interested in calculating the effect. I want to stick with manipulating the cause. But on the opposite side of the equal sign. So that's so physics. just cool theoretical physicist who said one day, you know, nobody that I know of in my field understand uses the scientific method. It's leaps of logic. It's seat of the pants. It's guesswork. Hmm. That doesn't sound very uh, legit. What doesn't. about that? What about that astrophysicist that took his calculator out, made a couple of calculations, and that ca and he calculated the effect of the Earth's rotation on the kicked field goal in between the, the whoever it was that was playing the game of American football that, that he that... was able to watch on television, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The double speak's unbelievable. Well, that would be uh, well, space Coriolis, right? There's a magic speed. <laughs> I, th I think I hey, got that. Magic. I haven't asked in a while. Hey, Eddie Glover's in there. Got anything on the magic speed? I got it. I, I want to know, man. Hold on, chocolate. Go I on, got John. it. The magic speed is the speed at which the moon travels around to like like a baseball bat hit the asteroids. Like a, a ball, the uh, a bat does a ball, so that the impact is always circular. Sorry, that would imply that it's not in what they call tidal locking, tidally locked with Earth. We always see the one face. That would imply that it's spinning like a baseball for the. I don't know how you'd mathematically calculate the input trajectory to always be at ninety degrees based on it spinning, but that's what you're saying. But that it's but it's not. No, the... The moon would be like the bat. The bat? <laughs> what? No. You can hit a bat at any angle. That's why the ball can sometimes go off flying in the air. If you're playing baseball and you watch a kid play and he hits it at the top edge angle, it'll go off flying up into the air, right? At the Unless inverse of whatever it, it hit magic it at, spot. Across that, that curved surface. So no, that does, that does... You're just making this stuff up, John. That was poor. Normally, your standards are much higher than that. Wait, no, uh, uh, it's got a sweet spot, right? Everybody's got a sweet spot, so that's that's got to be it, right? Right? No, that's the magic good, speed. Actually. Well, I'll call you Zor when I get to the moon. I can't get to the moon. It's a light in the sky. It's not a physical rock in a sky vacuum you can travel to, nor is it contained within a presupposition of a firmament. Firmament Wait a second. container. We can't say it's a light in the sky either if we can't get there, so we don't know what it is. It is demonstrably a light in the sky. I can say that. There it is. I can agree with that. A light in the sky. Until we could get there and see what it is. What's light, Neil? It's a massless particle. It's a wave. That sounds a lot like a level curve, that, doesn't it? Straight curve, level curve. Massless particle. Yeah. What's mass? We see something up there. There's something up there. Mass is a concept. Good answer. Neil, you have a problem calling the moon? Do you have a problem calling the moon a light? Uh, no, it's definitely, well, definitely like a light. Else too? I go outside. I go outside in my backyard when there's a full moon. I can literally read a book by the light and how bright that is. And when it's not there, 
it's extremely dark in my back. So yeah. Even the, even the scripture says it's the lesser light to rule by night and the greater light to rule by day is the sun. It is a light. Okay, let me, let me let me tell Just you. Just the me point on. How. I understand what you're saying. Let me tell you how this guy was taking me to it and drove me to go on this little escapade with you. He said, yeah, well, you have a light in your house, and that that's the light, right? So you could touch that light. Maybe the moon is like that, too. Yes, it's a light, but it's also tangible. Okay. Nice. But there are different Gober? ways of... There are different is that ways of light. Neil, there are yeah. different ways of light propagation. The problem is we don't know how. Yeah, right. So that's why well, that guy was a globe. Why light. would he call the moon a light? No, but he was also it, saying well, it, it's, it's a light, a, just like your house. There's a light in your house, but it's 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 something. It's there. You could unscrew the light bulb at But that's just can. that's just one form of light. Like you're not right. talking about light being reflected through something else. There are many ways in which we can see light. So again, you don't know how that light is propagated. So we get there. Get there is under the assumption that you can get there. Oh God, we go around in circles. <laughs> I'm, hey, listen, I had a These it's damn New Yorkers. <laughs> he, probably, he probably just heard Frank Sinatra singing, Fly Me to the Moon. Fly and, me to the moon. And therefore, my magic bat theory is true. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> segue from the beginning bit everyone's forgotten about and declare your victory. Excellent. Excellent. That was much Backed more like up. it. Much Excellent more like Backed it, John. Up there, John. Uh, you know, I had plenty of practice, like three years of it. Well, hold on. They're saying that when, in other words, when the ball actually hits the bat, you're not at the bat is not actually hitting the ball. What what John did was hitting atoms and stuff in between. What what jo what John just tried to do is quite interesting because at about the time everyone was drawing tangent point horizons to the Isle of Man, uh, Anthony Riley had only just made his introductions to me after telling me I was using my mic wrong, tenth man, and <laughs> he basically took me to one side and said, "Look, you're in charge of this show, and here's an example where Hank Hill." makes a killer point about the inverse square law and the stars. And then three or four other people obfuscate the point. It gets lost in the weeds. He leaves. And then his opponent, a period of time later, declares his victory. Whilst also simultaneously um, making a declaration that effectively lost him the argument. But he let that in whilst declaring his victory. Now, Anthony, he didn't edit it, but he, he got all the timestamps ready. He made a full-on presentation to me, appealed to me as the channel owner. If you want something done, that's how you do it, by the way. <laughs> so, anyway, he sat me down. He took me through his argument. He explained what his concerns were, explained what the problem was, showed me an example of the problem, and then said, that's your fault, basically. He didn't say it in those terms, but he was like, you're in charge. That's your fault. And you need to do something about that. And as a direct result of that conversation, the direction of the show drastically changed. And that was as a direct result of, I can't remember, I think it was Paper Explanator and Hank Hill were the two right. people in question. Um, but what was done was just done by John. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm not, it should, it, yeah. <laughs> when I say much better standard, I mean much better example of a Globe Fundy that will <laughs> rumpus a point to get it away from his losing argument. Disclaim why he would have lost had he wasn't, had he not be declaring victory in that particular moment, which is what happened. Who's, who's Hank Hill in the story? Is he the baller or? Hank Hill's the, uh, the flat earther. Okay. And, Paper Explanator is the globe head. Hank Hill makes a point about not getting the distance to the stars and his arguing point was about the inverse square law. The person then had lots of fundy muting and obfuscation from his partners in crime only to, I think it was like 50 minutes later, I'm not even kidding, say, oh, by the way, that point that I would have lost if I'd have mentioned the fact that the inverse square law destroyed my argument, I actually won that argument because, and then made, remade his claim in the first instance. Yeah, and there was another really good example with Brandon Toy on Geo Streber's channel again with Rumpus. Um, Brandon was 
in the middle of arguing about the Etzvos effect, and Geo Strieber presented a graph, and it was a four, it was a four-axis graph in the four quadrants: top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And Brandon spots that this is generated by a computer. This is not real-world data. And he asks, "Where's the origin from, of the data from?" And Geo Strieber says, "It's it's um, from the model." And he was like, and he was literally just about to say, "So this is not real-world data. This is reification fallacy, right?" And Rumpus spotted that that's what was going to come next. So basically, Brandon was about to win his point. Rumpus spotted it, then committed a tactical foul by Rumpusin so that the point didn't get made. Therefore, um, basically, he didn't win his point because Rumpus made enough noise, um, and Geo Strieber kicked him out. Now, Brandon at the time didn't realise that Rumpus was Rumpusing to make sure the point didn't get won. Um, Brandon just saw Geo Strieber kicking him out and thought, "Oh, he's a nice guy. He was deliberately kicking him out because he was being an idiot." Fair play to, to Geo Strieber. But the bigger picture was Rumpus had just distracted enough to create enough noise so that the point then got lost, and Brandon didn't get didn't get the victory he was just about to take. So Rumpus took a tactical foul, got kicked. Brandon didn't get the victory he, he deserved that he. he that he correctly identified and I went back to him afterwards and I said listen go back and listen to what's just happened there I said this is what's just happened he's he's done you I said in future make sure that that doesn't happen again I said because he's done you anyway and, he went uh, back he listened to it and he was like the right. prediction Anthony saying it's not that he's mystic Meg, it had actually happened before so did you say it was Geo Schreiber yeah yeah Geo Schreiber had been pummeled on that exact point it's that boss effect correct yes Betty had had him over a barrel on it and spanked his ass. So Rumpus knew that... where that was going to go when it was Brandon. So it was much further down the line. But that argument had come, been pointed out as a reification fallacy by um, Betty to Geo Schreiber. So when it was happening again, as Anthony puts it, there's a tactical foul. In other words, Rumpus causes enough disruption for him to have to be told to shut up, threaten to kick out, kick him out. That all took a couple of minutes, by which time Brandon's not going to go... Right, back on track again. So, this is a reification then. It's not measured from anything in the real world. You're deriving it from your presuppositional model. Therefore, it's a reification fallacy. That didn't happen. And that's the reason for the tactical foul. When was this? Three years About ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. When Brad- yeah, we know better now, right? We do well, know better he- now, yeah. But it, he the, tried- point Nathan's, the point Nathan's making is there are active tactics at play that we didn't realise initially because they, they do rumpus points. That's why they can't come in. They claim that they're on strike or Nathan's this or Nathan's that or whatever. The reality is it's tactical because they come in and lose. That's the reason why they don't come in. He tried that today. I was doing a little short piece on the sextant and how it works and how it can all work. And he came in chat and he wanted to come in to distract from that. Would you agree with that, Nathan? Of course. Well, I'm justified now. So why do you now. give him a chance? I'm justified now to just say, you're a proven liar. Got you on record. His first words were, I always refracted everything. Everything would include the horizon he drew a straight line to. Therefore, liar. Proven liar. Well, just say that when he comes. You're a proven liar. What are you doing here? You've got no credibility anymore. You were already a nameless, faceless troll. Now you're a nameless, faceless troll with no credibility who lies. Bye-bye, Rumpus. Nice knowing you, you liar. Well, if you can confuse the point as the dominant um, perspective, it's just as good as a win. Exactly, and that's why. Well, it's even better if you take it from somebody that's about to win at your cost, because obviously Geo Strieber didn't know what was coming next. Rumpus did. He took it away from uh, uh, Brandon Toy unfairly, and Geo Strieber didn't realise. Now they did Brandon, but I was watching it, and I was like, "You, you clever little weasel! That's exactly what you've just done." Yeah, the tactical foul works because if the majority of the audience are already on the side of the globe. And something that could come along that could sway that viewpoint is eradicated, then the consensus view rules at the end of the discussion. Now they know that. They've got consensus on their side. So they don't need to uh, put in any airs and graces. They can be as foul and as derogatory as they choose. None of it will ever be criticised because the consensus view is that we're the idiots that deserve ridicule. Therefore, it's perfectly valid and justified. You know, all of that sort of stuff. Meanwhile, Our standard, the standard we are held to, is infinitely higher than theirs. 
Well, I like to think we hold ourselves to that standard, too. Well, we do, and that's why people fall out with each other on this topic, because I'll say, <clears throat> I'm going to set Bob, gravimeters don't do what you say they're doing, and then all of a sudden it starts an internal political war, and the point basically doesn't isn't allowed to fr turn into fruition. It, it becomes a, a hot potato, and people are a little bit more cautious about claiming gravimeters do prove that there's a downward bias. We don't hear that conversation anymore, right? No one's talking about the downward bias. So that point's been extinguished. What bias? Exactly. But if if we wouldn't have done it, then people will, this, that conversation would still be taking place. Yeah, but then Rumpus runs around and says, like today, he'll say need to even give him a chance. Chance for what? I mean, I gave Rumpus an opportunity to prove his lie. I said, come back with the show number where you said the horizon was refracted. Now he came back, called me a wanker. Following time he came back, same thing, same conversation, and he lied multiple times. Tried to dodge and duck and weave, and at one point even said, I always refracted the hor lighthouse. Because he's stumbling around his lie. Now I've demonstrated that. Rumpus is a liar. So what are you going to do? Bleat about not getting an opportunity after you've lost all credibility, having lied about your claims and tried to dodge and duck and weave around your lie to the point where you're stuttering over the thing you're lying about. I always refracted the lie house. Yeah, you didn't refract the horizon. You drew a tangent to it. That's demonstrably factually accurate. And now you've got to lie about it because you haven't got it anymore. That's the facts of the situation. You're a proven liar, Rumpus. Bleat all you like, liar. Yeah, but the ballers don't even believe him anymore. So he's on an island all by himself. Oh. Yeah. He's got the right Was that a little feeling towards Trumpus there, Chocolate? Oh. Yeah, I think I want to get my uh my Kleenex from real quick. Hey, listen, he could come and be honest if he wants to be. You think it's so? quite humiliating. He could also have a nice conversation like a human being if he wanted to be. But he hasn't done that in years. No, he doesn't even say hello. He just comes on calling names. Right. Well, now I've got a name for him. Well, it's more of a label. Liar. See, that's why I call him a greasy lawyer, guys. <laughs> that's what he is, man. Yeah, a bit more difficult to greasy lawyer out your way around your own lies, though, eh, Rumpus? When you've got a claim that you refracted everything, when you drew a tangent to Earth Curve to claim it blocked the Isle of Man. Yeah, that refracted line that you don't need but must show us in total contradiction of your lies. Well, that's unfair to anybody watching to subject them to a known liar. I think you'll all agree. Oopsie. Yeah, I was happy you handled it the way you did today. That way, he's he knows how he can come back on. Come back on. Don't lie. Admit okay. to that first. And maybe there's chance for him to change, but we'll see. Yeah, how do you absolutely. humiliate somebody with no humility? And you see, the thing is, I don't, I don't take that attitude. In the same way as people who expect newbies to the subject to appeal to a flat earther for answers they formerly got from nasa it's like well you're a cuck you're dependent on the teat of government or now our teat of information and it's pathetic insisting on having this information handed out to you well once you discover that someone like nasa is a liar the people on the screen telling you they're in space are liars you turn your back on them you don't say Look, NASA, I'll start trusting you if you can just admit you lied. Because what do you think a liar's going to do? I'm sorry, I lied. If it comes to the point where they're forced to admit it, yeah, they'll admit it. Okay. Does that change a damn thing? Does it stop them lying to you again? More for you if you entertain those people. Turn your back on them. Don't engage. Yeah, but there was an astronaut that came to the church I attend. And everybody believes him. Yeah. He was in a rocket and he went to the moon. 
because he stood at a pulpit and declared it. Yeah, people can lie, Neil, and do. Astronauts are one of the few categories of people I can put hand on heart and say they are liars. You don't even have to go that far, Neil. I mean, just any Sunday or whenever, just turn on one of those fancy Ferrari driving televangelists. They stand at the pulpit and lie. No, they're not Ferrari drivers. I just they're tell hell. people to prosperity doctor. People just the need hell. to take back their own authority, man. Like your authority was taken away the day, you know, people started instilling in your head that we live on a ball. And you were just supposed to believe that. No validation. You know what I'm saying? And that's a problem. <laughs> so all I tell people is just take back your own freaking authority. That's it. Which leads me to believe that maybe they're putting these guys in simulations. And they think they're going to outer space and the moon. Don't be naive. How could you stand at a pulpit and lie? I mean, no. no fear of God? Don't, don't put down to this deception when it's in front of green screens and on trapeze there is no way on earth they don't know that they're on a high wire they absolutely know oh yeah hello Arwen on Bloody hell. Arwen. yeah run away mic wide open why don't you we all do it. It's not a big crime. You mean you do it? Yeah, frequently. I was opening up a bag the other day. I didn't even know because I changed over. To... <laughs> I got yelled at. It was an accident. Yes, Nathan. Like me, I've done it before, once or twice. Yes, it's... once or twice. Obviously, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Only once or twice, right, Anthony? The people lie all the time. You don't have to try to figure out why they lie. Once you know they lie, that's it. You know they can't be trusted. No, but here's part of the deception. He's an older guy. He's got his wife next to him. He's standing at the pulpit at Times Square Church, and everybody believed him. Well, tell me and something you new, tell Neil. Tell anybody anything after that? Yeah. Tell me That's something new, firm. Neil. Hang on, Neil. Tell me something new. It don't matter if it's at the pub, in a courtroom, or a pulpit. People lie. Yep, that's correct. What's a really sad thing is if you get a woman that's been raped violently at knife point in a dark alleyway at night time and she tells a story, most people won't believe that, but they will believe they went the fucking moon. Well, thank you for that. What, what about the ones claiming they are and are not? Well, my body, a, my choice. As, as you've brought it what? up now, I know I'll pick that box in my youtube declaration of what this video contains i noticed that do you remember i gave a mention to that umbrella guy the other day when i was saying oh you must share this video my appeal to action is more worthy than this guy's appeal to action when he talks about just to segue the domestic violence claimed by johnny depp and amber heard against each other in a long ongoing british and american court case the british one having concluded now in Amber Heard's favour against Johnny Depp. Now, that particular case, which was actually a libel case against the Sun, based on uh, a headline about Johnny Depp being a wife beater, well, in that instance, the person who was claiming the abuse, Amber Heard, was absolutely believed. So your comparison goes to hell. In that example now <laughs> i mention it because i noticed today one of the recommended videos was from a channel called little tug where he was <laughs> complaining that his, his channel's getting mass flagged by supporters of amber heard because he's anti amber heard so he's pro johnny depp in this particular courtroom battle the, the most recent of which uh, is going to be another defamation case brought in the first instance by johnny depp against amber heard for 50 million dollars no less, and then a counter suit for a hundred million dollars from Amber Heard against Johnny Depp. But if you talk about this subject now, I don't know if I'm, what I'm talking about. I don't think any of this is going to breach YouTube regulations to discuss this public information. But when they do it, they self censor. You know, Amber Heard becomes that nameless party. 
Johnny Depp becomes JD, <laughs> you know, um, domestic violence becomes DV. They've got all of these abbreviations that they slip into the video in their vain hope that that's going to stop them getting their videos taken down or demonetized. Uh, or in this case, mass flagged and then uh, community guideline strike being implemented so the guy can't live stream. And, you know, he's making a fairly healthy living from it, from what I'm understanding from his latest channel called Little Tug. But it's just interesting that you make that segue when the, the current situation in that regard is completely contrary to what you've used as a as a juxtaposition, <laughs> i.e. the abused woman won't get her story listened to. Well, in that case, Can I just it ask? was... Why did you feel the need to trample all over my equivalents? Um, I don't know. Did it make you feel masculine? No, Johnny Depp, hold on. After Donnie Brasco, something happens to actors after they play a wise guy role. They really think they're wise guys. And he probably did <laughs> knock <laughs> Oh, God, everything's got to link back to the Bronx, hasn't it? <laughs> So All I know. You, what happens if you should play the James Bond role? Does that make you, does make you think think you're like invincible? No, you only like wise guy roles. Only wise guy roles. Wise okay. guy roles. Well, a wise it's guy. It's not even a, a wise guy actually. in the future will refer to JD as not the rum. Not even a method actor. It's not like he would be living as a wise guy when he was playing that role. No, but oh, something I happens to him. It's I reckon Johnny Depp's walked around his, his apartment in a pirate suit a few times. Uh, I'm sure he has. He plays a pirate, or he did. No, no. Yeah, only yeah. white guy movies. Look at James Caan. He hangs out with gangsters since The Godfather. Okay. But why is the rum gone? Well, therefore, Johnny Depp does. <laughs> what the hell, Neil? I can scientifically prove it. Yeah, that's almost science. If you say science after that Just So story, it makes it valid scientifically with experiments, doesn't it, Neil? <laughs> I don't know. Something happens in the brain, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. Science, man. Something happens in the brain. Science. <laughs> Something Chemical happens calculate. in the brain and they think they're wise guys. Yeah, yeah. Calculate the effect and give it sense. a name and make it sound psychological, like the, the quantum annihilation effect or something like that. And then it's all become, all of a sudden, it does become science. Yeah, jazz it up a bit, Neil. That, that's where I messed up with my magic speed uh, bat theory. I should have said science at the end of that. I'll, I'll work exactly. on it. Exactly. But listen, I'm going to get a list of actors together that after playing a wise guy role or a good fellow role, they want a little uh, baddie there. I, I know one. I know one. John Connor at a Terminator. He, he ended up being a little bit nuts, didn't he? Oh, I thought you were about to say he ended up being chased by a robot that came back from the future to kill his mother. But with that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video.